and a warm welcome to our latest Beyond Radley talk. We started these talks for the boys in lockdown and wanted to continue them now as a way to share thought-provoking perspectives from the Radley community in a very accessible way on Zoom. The talks will feature Doms or Radleyans, Radley parents and boys, and the aim is to inspire and to challenge and to encourage us all to think and reflect on our changing world and our place in it. Now, before I introduce you to our speaker, Mark Fawcett, just a few housekeeping items, please. Please keep your microphones on mute. If you want to ask a question, please put it onto the chat. And the event will be recorded for our use later and disseminated on our website and through our emails. Now, stepping up to our virtual podium, I'd like to introduce Mark Fawcett, Radley parent and founder of We Are Futures. He advises leading businesses on how to better connect with young people. He'll talk about how employers are developing the way they hire and operate, how leadership approaches are changing in response to the evolving demands of business and young career starters, and finally, how he thinks this should influence the types of skills that young people need to build today. This promises to be a fascinating insight into the future world of work. Now, Mark will be interviewed after his talk by Radleyan 62 Jack Cooper, who has bravely stepped into the breach for George Hanlon, who couldn't do, it, uh, do the talk this evening because he's unwell. So now I'm, oh, and Jack will direct any questions on your behalf from the chat function to Mark. So that's enough from me. I'm going to hand you over to Mark. Thank you, Mark. Um, Carolyn, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. So the purpose of this session sounds quite simple at first to help gain an insight into the developing world of work the attitudes of employers and to help you get a little bit ahead in the earlier years of your career but clearly this is a, a massive topic it's impossible to nail down in just one hour so i'm going to focus on observations and information around four connected topics Firstly, the changing nature of today's young generation. This is information from extensive research that's getting through to businesses and it's affecting the way they think and act. Secondly, the changing needs within businesses and also the changing nature of business leadership. Then thirdly, how this all leads to changes in the way that they're looking for future talent. And lastly, how career starters can help themselves get ahead, the skills, the attributes you need to develop, practical things you can do to stand out and to grow within roles. And I'm hoping that that will set the scene for some interesting questions and discussion. But first, to give you a bit of context about what I say, I should give you a little bit of a snapshot of my background so you can make your own judgment about where these views and information are coming from. So my first role after university was joining the army. I served in Europe and the Middle East and the army, as you'd suspect, it actively teaches leadership and skills like planning and organization. And then it places you in situations which test those skills pretty hard. After that, I joined a company called World Challenge and um, I was leading jungle and mountain expeditions there with young adults aged between 16 and 20. I trained other leaders, I trained the teachers, the young people taking part. Uh, I also led the marketing activity and then was the managing director as we grew this and expanded it into the United States. So that placed me for the first time in a business context facing the challenges of growth. We grew from a 1 million to a 20 million value business and were ultimately bought by TUI, the, uh, Gro the global travel group. My current business, We Are Futures, has also been growing very well in recent years. We work with senior leaders from a range of corporates and public sector organizations like uh, BP, Sky, Nike, Snapchat, Unilever and the NHS. And we help them better understand and connect with young people. We advise them, Deloitte, NatWest, even McDonald's on how to better support recruit and motivate people of your age. So we're always getting under the skin of how they are changing the way that they operate. So I've been really fortunate to have a, a career of learning about and teaching leadership in a, in a huge range of settings, often very successfully and sometimes spectacularly failing. But almost 30 years of working with young adults, uh, soldiers, expeditionists, students, career starters between the ages of 16 and, and 28, really. So to start then, 
Let's just take a quick look at today's young generation, the group of which most of you, parents aside, are part of. This may seem a bit odd, why is some random dad talking to us about us? What does he actually know? So you may not agree with all or even much of what I'm going to go through on an individual level, but what matters is that this is the information that is backed by a huge amount of research that is being given to employers and is affecting the way that they think and act. Every generation changes. It's affected by the circumstances in which it develops. And then within each generation, there are greater differences between groups, communities, and demographics than there are between the broad generations themselves. So any use of generation terminology has got to be used with caution, really. But the characteristics of each generation are real. They are shaped by the economic, uh, the political, the social, the education factors around them, and also by entertainment, by technology, and by trends. And the characteristics of, of this generation, of your generation, do differ more from other generations in many key areas than those generations did from their predecessors. The top end of, of Generation Z or Gen Z are now in their late teens and 20s. You are the new customers, the new workers, the new talent, and also the largest generation ever. And this generation has been shaped by a range of factors that affect how, how they perceive and relate to the world around them. And these include things like a, a rapidly changing workforce uh, requirement, of adaptable skills and increasing need for critical thinking and, and complex problem solving, none of which are really actively taught. Um, accelerating divisions amongst nations, people, not just political like Brexit, Trumpism, China and the West, but wealth divides too, and, and obviously the war in Ukraine. There's tech acceleration and its, its ever-present nature um, bringing sort of never before known levels of connection and access for both good and bad. And business demand for these advanced digital skills far outweigh the supply of young talent with those skills. There's also a far stronger microscope on, on fairness and equality. And recently, and hugely, um, COVID and the lockdowns, the, the impact of which has been substantial and will be felt for, for years to come. Younger workers were the hardest hit age group in the UK. There were greater numbers furloughed and losing their jobs than older colleagues. And if that's your first job, then that really hurts. And the education impact has been huge. So a quarter of pupils had no formal schooling or tutoring during lockdowns. Those from disadvantaged backgrounds fell even further behind their peers and have not caught up and many will never do so. And also around well-being, with half of young people believing their mental health has worsened and also those with actual stated conditions up by 60 percent so big big things and all of these these backgrounds these factors have created four strong characteristics of this generation that differentiate them from those older than them these are consistent in research consistent in feedback and as i said they may not apply to you personally but they are real and importantly businesses are listening and thinking about how they act and these four characteristics, firstly, they're more fluid in their interests, in their career paths, their identities. They move more freely between multiple interests and cultural genres and shared opinions. They expect to have four jobs before they're 30 years old, and they feel less the need to be fixed to a certain sort of norm or being a type. Secondly, and unfortunately, they are also too often more unhappy, lonely, lacking confidence and, and unsatisfied. They have increased uncertainty about their purpose, anxiety about the future, more concern than older generations about a range of issues from mental health, the environment, social inequality. Uh, third characteristic, they fight for fairness. They are passionate about issues relating to social equality and fairness. Uh, they don't believe in politics as a way to make change. And so we'll tackle it in any way they see fit outside of, of, of previous norms, whether that be about, about race, about gender or about social divides. And the fourth characteristic, um, especially amongst emerging adults, sort of age 16 to 24, they believe more than any other generation form about the importance of being happy in their career. Um, in fact, they define 
success in their career as how happy they are actually doing it. They need to add value, they need to make a difference. And those four characteristics provide context uh, because they are statistically significantly different from older generations because as we and others see them regularly in the work that they do, they are subtle, but they are widely present. Now that can all sound a bit negative, but there's, there's far more to it than that. This generation coming through is amazing on so many levels. They're actually very resilient, even if they question that themselves. They are caring, um, they, they give a damn about things. They're prepared to go out of their way to make a difference. They're ambitious in all the positive sense of the word. They're not frightened to push back. They are entrepreneurial. They will create side hustles, new businesses and media content as the norm. And they are therefore changing the way that businesses operate, the way that businesses hire and the way that businesses show leadership. So while there are these characteristics and effect, uh, and factors affecting how your generation sees the world and is perceived by it, it's also useful to think about the macro, the sort of big scale factors affecting businesses and employer mindset over the next few years. Now, from an HR and talent perspective, the businesses have been firefighting rather than creating long-term value over the last three years. Market volatility, uh, global talent shortage and COVID impacts are still very strong. They are now doing more to address this and to have a more strategic forward-looking approach. This is good for career starters because it means that businesses are again planning more for the long-term future. The impact of technology on jobs and working practices is accelerating and will continue to do so. Um, it's still barely scratched the surface in some sectors, for example, law and even car manufacturing. The changes we will see over the next decade will be substantial and, and exciting. Um, think how, on one sense, gathering a group of us here on Zoom is just so normal right now, yet barely any of you had done this three years ago. Uh, artificial intelligence, AI, nanorobotics, the metaverse will all move faster and faster into the mainstream. Globally, we're also seeing rapidly changing workforce requirements. So the demand for the sort of skills that can take us to net zero, that can focus on solving problems, that can exploit technology or tackle the changes and opportunities of an aging population. And as a result of all of this, we're seeing increasing competitive recruitment with companies and, and actually whole sectors fighting harder to bring the best talent to them. This means your degree, if you go to university, is less and less of a determinant of your ultimate career direction because employers are more than ever, they're looking for talent, not qualifications. They're responding as well to the changing expectations really of, of new talent and future workers. Uh, a very large American study released just this week showed that just over half, 55% of Generation X, so that's two generations older, were considering quitting their job. That's over half. 66% um, of, of millennials or Generation Y, and staggeringly 72%, so almost three quarters of Gen Z workers, those sort of 20 to 27 year olds, were looking to leave their job. This almost unprecedented level of job movement creates fantastic opportunities for career starters looking to find the roles they really want. And employers are responding to the demands that new talent wants. Principally, they want flexibility, they want balance, they want skills development, and they want packages that are built around salary but go far beyond, uh, much further beyond that than before. Businesses as well and, and their particular brands are far more sensitive to criticism due to the fundamental impact it can, it can more swiftly have upon them. So if they gain a bad reputation for poor environmental practices, um, for dodgy supply chains, it can faster than ever before negatively affect their sales and their results. What is newer is that it also quickly affects people wanting to go and work for them. So young career starters are turned away from companies that don't appear to uphold the values that they themselves believe in. 
And the very nature of social media and shared content means reputations can be harmed far faster than businesses can respond to that. Businesses also increasingly being forced to change their view of, of people um, from being consumers. In other words, we exist to just buy their stuff uh, to being citizens in their community, meaning we have to exist together, companies and people in, in harmony. So humans as consumers is a relatively recent 20th century attitude, and it's already starting to shift on from that, driven by increasing interaction, lack of trust in political leaders and global corporations, and the ability of people to join together and, and make change. So as a result of this, all of those sort of factors, business leadership is increasingly values-led and purpose-focused. This means that chief executives and leaders are looking at more than just growth. And this isn't just because they need to, to be successful in bringing the best people and building positive relations with, with all stakeholders, including governments and shareholders. It's because the new business, the new generation of business leaders personally believe more and more and care about having a positive impact on the world, about their purpose beyond profit, if you want, about their own legacy. And just as an example of this, um, Alison Rose is the chief executive of the NatWest Group, who own uh, NatWest, obviously, um, but also Coots, Ulster Bank, RBS, and others as well. And on her first job, her first day in the job about three years ago, she said that my vision is to build a bank that is purpose-led. She didn't talk about profits, she didn't talk about the number of customers or the share price. And this isn't just nice sort of public relations fluff stuff. It's been about her leading changes in the way the business operates and many initiatives, uh, including volunteering, expanding their education activities, uh, community work to help young unemployed people and much more. They've helped change perceptions of a struggling bank internally and externally. And not only that, they've actually been key measured factors in the business beating market expectations in 2022 and becoming one of the fastest growing banks, achieving a 300% growth in brand value over the last three years. So it's just a small and a quick, quick example of how changing approaches to leadership are creating commercial growth. They're creating a more positive community impact and they're actually getting more people wanting to work for you. So it's it's a win, win, win for, for her and the bank. And all of these changes, are they're not visible from one day to another, but they are very clear over relatively short time frames for around five years. So you can look back now at what was going on over the time frame of your few years at Radley, and during that same time frame, significant shifts are happening in all the ways of which businesses are looking at their customers, looking at their communities and looking at the people they bring in. And you can project that forward as well because the rates of a lot of these changes are accelerating. So that's just a quick snapshot of what's happening in business, uh, but also in government, third sector organizations and the way they're being led. So how is this all changing the way that employers are actually recruiting? So businesses are considering the changing nature of young career starters and also thinking about their own challenges and their own context. Um, what are they doing? The key words here are talent and potential. These are the holy grails for organizational recruiters now and way more important than qualifications. We might come on to that in the questions, I suspect. Um, qualifications. qualifications. <laughs> Qualifications can certainly we're getting some feedback now. Um, qualifications can certainly uh, open a door uh, and they can grab initial attention, definitely. But unless in their very specific queer careers with strict qualification needs like, like medicine, they matter less now than in the past, and that trend will continue. Now, a strong degree from a top university, just reassuring parents, especially a strong degree from a top university still carries a lot of weight, but the proportional value that employers give to that is reducing. So if employers are looking for talent and potential, how are they going about this? First, they're looking for skills. 
and the potential of people to develop skills. Um, a recent study by CV Library showed that the top skills UK employers are, so it shows the top skills that UK employers are favouring right now. And amongst the top six are adaptability, resilience, ability to change and networking. They're also genuinely looking for people who will add to the morale of an organisation. They're looking for an attitude that will add to their culture. Secondly, they're going younger. Um, whole sectors such as construction, engineering, hospitality, retail, they're developing initiatives that engage and inform young people while they're still at school and their teachers and their parents. They want to show the huge opportunities available in different career routes, most of which are not widely known, um, especially, sorry for this, by teachers and parents. Um, thirdly, they're widening the talent search in, in pretty innovative ways. So they're looking far beyond their traditional routes. They're engaging a lot more with communities and demographics that have previously been um, underrepresented in their businesses. In practice, this means they're doing things like working actively with partner organizations who operate in communities or regions from which they haven't previously recruited. Um, it means they're improving and widening their entry routes, including apprenticeship programs, to reach people who don't have a family history of going to university or who individually are worried about £50,000 worth of debt they could saddle themselves with. I was very recently in a group session with Deutsche Bank who were telling their graduate apprenticeship applicants that if they joined through that route, they would be the managers of their friends who went to university and joined three years later. And they would earn a salary throughout and they would still end up with a degree. So that's appealing to a lot of people. Um, and fourth, they're developing their actual recruitment approach. So they're using a much wider range of uh, digital recruitment tools. And I'm sure you'll have, you'll have covered this or experienced it yourself. They're using social media, they're using chatbots, uh, artificial intelligent recruitment software, um, applicant tracking systems, ATS, as you've probably heard of. Many of these are now shifting towards much more sophisticated digital uh, recruitment options in a bid to attract applicants online, uh, to automate processes like candidate screening, um, even in some cases sending automated rejection letters and onboarding processes. And they're increasing the use of remote uh, and blind screening or blind interviewing. They're also increasing internal recruitment because this is really cost effective and it boosts retention and it shortens the learning curve and that means they take somebody who's one area of the business and they recruit them into another area of the business and this actually makes it much easier for people in the early stage of their careers to enter organization in one role when they actually have their eye on a different role in that business in the future and finally they're much more focused than ever on the talent experience so in other words, what it feels like to start working there. They are doing things like improving the training and development opportunities so career starters can see how much value they will gain in developing the skills they need for the future. The irony of, of those of you, uh, you know, in your late teens and 20s is you've heard the word skills throughout your education and early, um, uh, and early career uh, timings, but the education system we have in the UK is not really set up to develop those skills. So you have a generation of people saying we need these skills, we're crying out for them, but we don't know them. So the businesses are doing more to actually say, come to us and we will give you the skills you need. They're also more strongly living values which connect to which connect with young people, ensuring the activities around areas like environment, uh, fairness, diversity. They're not just lightweight lip service, they're actually doing something. So basically they are competing with each other um, to make their business a better place to start your career, which is good news for you. So in summary, what they're doing is they're increasingly looking for talent over knowledge, um, for potential over qualifications and for skills over subjects. So, so what? Um, let's move on to the final section. You might ask, what does this mean for me? What can I do about it? How can I actually use this? So when Caroline asked me to do the session and to, to cover this 
massively wide topic i wanted to ensure i wanted to try and ensure there was something useful to take out of it um in an increasingly competitive recruitment market whether you're about to start university whether you're looking for your first role or you're already working and to wanting to develop your opportunities at your company i would recommend four things four things i see so much of um in that people who bring these to the table um they get to move to a bigger table really um firstly know about the tech impact and potential in your target sector now read up on this discuss this as widely as you can gain an opinion on what the advancements of data ar uh, ai are likely to have on the routes you're looking at now you could be looking at finance and banking science the military, uh, it doesn't matter, education, sport, engineering, politics, or any one of a huge range of sectors out there. Be informed about the digital changes coming and use your own imagination about how far they could go. And no matter how far you think they could go, it's probably further. So get involved in those discussions. Um, ensure that you can talk about this with your employers or at interview stage, because they are just desperate in their desire for young people with digital skills and if you don't have the technical skills you can have the information and the vision then choose specific skills and consciously work on developing them um, a business or work skill in essence is no different from an artistic a language or a sporting skill in that it can be developed and improved through practice and in that everyone can improve and don't be general when you approach this. Be targeted. You don't uh, you don't improve your rugby by just going out and chucking a ball around the same way every day. You use drills. Um, you watch videos. You listen to coaches. The same applies if you choose to develop your leadership, your team development, your problem solving, or your creative skills. And the same skills which will help you succeed in any career direction you may take. Now it may seem a big ask, but just you know use your imagination if you put a drop of water in a glass every day you will eventually fill that glass next be able to demonstrate specific impacts you've delivered and how you deliver them through leadership no this is not talking about things you have done it's talking about the impacts you have made from those things and how you went about achieving them employers are looking for people who can deliver a result but fair enough, hang on, you might think, I haven't really done anything yet. I've been at school or I'm at university. I'm only in the first year of my job. Well, if you look a bit deeper, you will be able to explain. So if, for example, that fundraising thing you did, you didn't just take part in a fundraising campaign at school or work. What you actually did is you saw and understood a problem and then you decided to do something about it. Then you made a plan, then you focused your efforts and you built a team and then you delivered a specific impact. The money you raised, uh, or students at Radley more recently, the bicycles you collected are now allowing a group of people to do something they could not do before. And that is what employers are looking for. You had an impact. And lastly, um, and perhaps surprisingly, most importantly, become a storyteller this is the single most undervalued under practice yet critically important skill you can develop we see this time and time again communication has driven the human race since we could string some syllables together beyond a grunt and storytellers have been at the heart of our development and growth Scientists explaining COVID on TV are storytellers and the best teachers are storytellers and entrepreneurs, prime ministers, business leaders, the best of all of them can tell a story that captures imagination. And because despite all the tech, despite the globalization, despite the competition, we are still very, very much human and stories are a uniquely human trait and to sell an idea to pitch for investments, to promote a product, to convince someone to change something, and to sell yourself, you have to sell a story. So in this short and hopefully not too rushed time, what have, what have I explored a little bit? A bit about the changing nature of today's young generation, the information that's getting through to businesses. Um, 
a look at the changing needs and leadership within business, uh, some thoughts on how those factors are affecting how organisations are acting recruiting. And finally, some concluding thoughts on how career starters can help themselves get ahead. I wanted to finish with just final thought for tomorrow's leaders. Many of you will lead others in some capacity. You may have started your own venture already. You may have ambitions to reach great heights in your chosen career. Leaders matter uh, and leadership can obviously be used for good, for bad, for profit, for community gain. And for the leads of the next decade, I'd offer two thoughts. The first is embrace uncertainty. Um, you can choose if uncertainty feels like a threat or an opportunity. Accelerated change will be a feature of the next decade and more. Anything can happen. And that can be a force on you or it can be a force within you. So embrace that and know that change will happen, that change creates opportunity and be the person to take advantage of that. And then set a clear and simple vision based on three equal parts. The ambitions or results you aim to achieve, that's the what. What it will be like for the people who work with you, which is the who and why the world will be a better place for your work, which is the why. Those three things equally show modern leadership and will take people with you. So there we are. Um, I hope it's been a useful introduction and a catalyst for some thoughts. I hope there's at least one thing you can take away from yourself. Uh, thank you very much. And I think now, Jack, it is over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. That was really interesting to just get an insight on your experience with many companies with the recruitment process. And I have a lot of questions. However, I'm only going to ask a couple. And whilst I ask those, if anybody in the audience would like to type any questions they have for Mark in the chat box, then that'd be perfect. Uh, so I'm going to start. Um, so you talked about obviously Gen Z being the biggest generation and the ever increasing competition um, in the employment sector. And it's got to the fact that we're now being interviewed by AI bots, which is bizarre to me sometimes. Um, and I was just wondering in what ways may Radley School leavers be disadvantaged, disadvantaged in your eyes as an employer and as students, how can we mitigate this? Ah, uh, it's interesting. Thank you, Jack, for throwing a particularly challenging question up, first of all. Um, in truth, rarely students aren't disadvantaged, they're hugely disadvantaged, I'm sorry, hugely advantaged from the school that, that you've been to. You have had a better chance than most to develop the sort of skills and start to showcase the sort of talent that employers are definitely looking for. Um, there's obviously a lot of um, media commentary and conversation amongst parents about what has changed over the last, you know, 20 years. So you can't just walk into a job because you went to a great school or a good university. And it's clear that universities and employers are looking more widely to, um, to find people, talents from more diverse backgrounds. So what you are doing is entering a, an employment market, which is perhaps more challenging than if your parents had gone to Radley and, and entered it. 30 years ago or so. But you need to focus on what you do have um, and you need to be able to, to tell that story because above all, they are looking for talents, they are looking for potential, and they're looking for skills. And from my experience as a parent of one son going through Radley, the school gives you lots of opportunity to do that. You just got to think about how to communicate it. But don't think of it being a disadvantage because you went to a private school and businesses therefore don't want to hire you. That's just the, not the case out there. Um, they always are looking for the best people. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, if I could just ask another question and then mm -hmm. I'll leave it to the audience. Um, obviously, there's a growing market for alternatives to university and you're talking about talent and potential over qualifications. Uh, do you think that it's a viable, like apprenticeships and kickstarts, there are a viable alternative to going to a university? Or 
Uh, absolutely, and they're getting better, but this is very much an individual and a family choice because um, there are still clearly some routes where a university degree is is the only way in, really. Um, the the value is, I think I said during that, of a, a good degree from a top university, it's always going to be there. It's just that the competition to, to going to university is stronger and better. Um, so apprenticeship degrees are more widely offered and they are better than they were. Um, support for other routes in are better. Um, employers are not just blindly saying, you, we're looking for a graduate with three years experience. They're going, no, let's think a little more cleverly and widely than that. So it can only be a personal choice. University degrees are still incredibly value, but bit by bit, they're moving from being not the only solution into one of other solutions as well. So on a personal level, explore what is best for you. Perfect, thank you very much. I think we'll open it to the meeting chat now. Isabel has asked, do employers value the use of psychometric testing in order to select for qualities such as resilience or future potential? Uh, yes, they do, um, but they use it to such, um, it's neither sector nor even really company specific in that some companies are very much fixed on that psychometric testing and other forms of sort of non-interview based testing are now forming a fundamental part of who they are. They're often doing this because they're looking for talent, different types of talent. They don't just want everyone to come from the same sort of background because they get better business results by having more diverse brains and inputs this. So that's what leading, that's what's leading a lot of it. But you could go for two interviews in the same sector, let's say for two engineering firms or for two banks, and find that one is drawing very heavily upon psychometric testing and the other is still using much more uh, traditional, even face-to-face -face interviewing the whole way through the process. So it varies hugely. Um, one of the challenges uh, you have is that you will likely be facing many different types of interview and selection process. The more you can familiarize yourself with all of them, the better. Thank you very much. I think Chip has a question. His hands up on the Zoom. If you'd like to unmute and ask that to Mark, then. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my name's Chip Summers. I'm a psychotherapist in OR. Um, and I agree with many things that you said, Mark, and I was really pleased to hear you talk about them, especially, I think, about somewhat the diminished quality, uh, the d d diminished importance of degrees, which is, uh, I think, uh, something that has really happened in the last, certainly in, in the last 20 years or so, it's become a diminished quantity. Um, and I also think that, because I also speak in public schools, alas, not Radley, uh, but um, about drug and alcohol use and particularly resilience, which you talked about. Um, and my experience is that schools haven't really caught up with the fact that uh, we have a whole generation who've been brought up using a phone. This is the first generation that will enter the world. Their only experience of communicating is with this phone, which in as a psychotherapist, I would say has diminished our emotional communication and verbal communication skills in general. I suppose before waffling again, to avoid waffling on about my opinion, do you think that, I mean, I've been to schools where they, I do a talk about resilience, they tick a box, and as far as they're concerned, that's the job done. I take the view that we should be concentrating so much more on resilience, communication, all those kind of things, that are so important in the modern world at the expense of maybe some other things that we used to think were super important that I personally have never used in my entire life. But um, uh, I think uh, I would like to see much more discussion, lectures and talks about those kind of more abstract things that are now yeah. uh, so important. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, that, that is a massive subject, Chip. It's a time, uh, it's an area I'm hugely interested in. We spent a lot of time on it in, in brief. Um, our, our education system in the UK was largely created as sort of in a, in a post-industrial revolution um, 
timing it has developed since then uh is is it fit for purpose for the next 20 or 30 years personally i'd say no it, it's going to take a huge amount to change that we we have a an education system that is far more subject focused and skills focused and we have a real world and an employment situation which is far more skills focused skills focused than subject focused I think from the perspective of, of those who have now been through that education system, um, and you know, I chose Radley for my son. I wish I'd gone to Radley as a child around the school I went to, but I, I think that for those who've been through it, you know, that's history now. They've done that education system. But what they can do is say, right, I know what I have been armed with and I know what I need. Therefore, I'm gonna focus myself on developing the skills that I think are gonna get me ahead. So for the purpose of today, I think there is a lot in individuals, people's control that they can do to really step themselves forward in the job that they're in or the one they want to get. The question about where the whole education system goes in the UK is, um, you know, that that is a big, big one, which um, I'm always happy to talk about, but probably would distract us in in this evening, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I think we'll have a few more. Um, Caroline asks, what is the best sector to go into right now in terms of growth and success? I mean, my guess would be the technical, technological side of things. Oh, I, I, I couldn't. Um, in truth, I can't answer what the best sector to go into is because it depends what you want. Um, every single sector is de desperate for... Um, tech and digital skills and thinking, every single one of them. And there are some ironies in this because one is that they talk about your generation, Jack, um, as being digital natives. In other words, you as Chip has said, have been brought up since a very young age with technology and the ability to communicate and interact with technology in your life from a very, very young age. Um, but that's actually not, that's not the digital skills that young people need. Uh, the, sorry, the business need. Businesses need digital tech skills that actually you don't develop yourself just by engaging with technology for communication and entertainment purposes. Um, they need a deeper level of thinking across that. So hence my urging there is that you don't have to learn coding. Um, it doesn't help if you, it doesn't harm you if you actually know what coding is so that if you see someone do it, you go, oh, they're coding. I know that. What it really does help you to do is to think ahead and go, I know what um, the latest chatbots are probably going to be doing in the industry that I'm interested in. I know what AI is likely to be doing because I've read about it, I've talked and I've used my imagination because the sort of roles you're going into mostly, you're not going to be coding but you're going to be leading decision-making and thinking, which can only be delivered with the application of technology. So that's why the more you learn and think about how to talk about the stronger position you're going to be in. Um, so that was actually, sorry, I was heading off a tangent. There isn't an individual sector. I could say it's better, depends what you want out of life. Um, but in all of those sectors, there are certain things that are really gonna help you um, move on. Um, you know, Philip has just said the charity sector has amazing opportunities. Teaching is a sector that is going to going to have so much interesting change and challenge over the next few years. Um, the way that uh, they're changing how um, uh, technologies and also how they interact with people is used in car manufacturing. That you know, car manufacturing is used. I mentioned that because it's using technology to obviously make cars. But so many of the car manufacturers are still focused on how they're going to make and sell cars. And not enough of them are taking account of the fact that less and less people are going to own cars because the concept of, of car sharing and um, sort of 360 life of an actual manufactured car is going to become increasingly important. So more and more of them will move to the, the stage where they don't sell you the car and then it's gone they're actually gonna be responsible for that car from the day it's made to the day it is recycled, reused and partially scrapped. And, and they're gonna actually rent their cars out the whole way through. So this is where so much is going to change, which is opportunity. Sorry, heading off at a tangent there. Thank you very much. Um, Sophie asked, 
are there industries which are failing to move at the times in terms of understanding the changing generational landscape? And if so, how can we change that to help new career starters succeed in all industries? Wow. OK, so that's sort of two questions covering everything, pretty much. Um, the the first I'm looking at that question because I want to get um, are there industries which are failing to move with the times in terms of understanding the changing generational landscape? Uh, yes, all of them actually are. Um, we we work across pretty much every major sector, um, and very few, I would say, are really getting to grips with it. Those that are are probably the ones that have been struggling for the longest. Um, so engineering and the actual uh, tech side and electrical engineering, everyone working in that sector, we are going to be desperately, desperately short by the tune of about half a million or so. The very engineering skills to actually deliver upon what the government says we're trying to achieve in this country in terms of net zero, in terms of electri electrification, we, we don't have anywhere near the number of people to do that. So that's a sector, for example, that has been trying for ages to, to widen its appeal and diversify those who are coming into it to get more talent coming in. It's also a sector that if you go into and you have talent and interest and vision for the future, you, you, you can fly in because there are just desperate need for that. Um, but there are no sectors we go into and think, you know, these guys have got it all. Um, so how can we change that to help new career starters succeed in all industries? I would again come back to the, the four points I put at the end. I put them down on purpose because time and time again, I see that people who are showing that they have those skills and are, are developing them further are ones that employers, and also people when they start with the ones going, that's who we want, that's who we need more than anything else. Um, they're not saying to us, we want X number more, two ones in this degree from this university. That is still very, very important, but it's not actually what they're looking for. Great, thank you. I think Cosmos just asked a question. How important is building a job portfolio when trying to show an employer your skills and ability to work in a team? Or is there a better way to show these attributes? Um, partly, I think that depends on whether you're at the I'm looking for a job stage or whether you're I'm in work and I'm now trying to build my um, opportunity and my skills within that ex, uh, within that um, organisation. The thing about a lot of um, the age group listening now is that your job portfolio is going to be limited because, you know, it's it's the ones in their mid 30s who can say these are four really growing and interesting jobs I've done. If you're in your mid 20s, late 20s, you haven't picked up a massive job portfolio. But what you can do is you can demonstrate the skills you have applied to solve the problems that were put in front of you. And I think I said it's more about showing impacts than what you've done. And that is also part of the storytelling and the language piece and, and going through the way that you package your experience and your achievements in, I had these impacts rather than I did these things is, is the way I would package selling your own story. Great, thank you. The thing about also doing these things on Zoom is I don't know at all if Cosmo is not any longer going, that was useful or thinking that's not what I meant at all. But um, <laughs> hopefully it was it was more to the former. I we have a bit of time to just have a few more questions. Uh, Caroline asked earlier, how important is real world work experience whilst at school? Um, the, the, the sort of torturous circle of we won't give you a job because you haven't got the experience. Well, I can't get the experience unless you give me a job. That 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 still exists. And again, I would refer back to um, those sort of points I was making about the end about these things can actually make a difference. Work experience is hugely valuable. Um, it it's it's not just for the CV bit, although if you articulate it properly, um, it can help on that. 
it's more because it helps anybody just open their eyes to what they like doing and what they don't like doing and the environment they like working in or not so i, I mean i've never come across any individual or any organization saying about an individual they did too much work experience um so yeah grab it as much of it as you can um and it, it, it's it's just it's it's the experience bit of that of those two words is critical uh great i'm just going to scroll up uh, definitely a few questions i saw um chip mentioned whilst he's talking about psych psychometric testing or was that chip i can't quite remember but he said psychiatry and therapy is going to be a massive growth industry as people become more disparate disparate and isolated um what it yes. oh i see psychiatry and therapy is going to be a massive growth industry as people become more disparate and isolated well unfortunately um we are definitely in an environment where there is an increasing level of anxiety and mental health issues amongst young people and by and i'm using the young people very generically there from you know the, the primary school age up until um up until mid and late 20s it, so from that perspective there's increasing demand for it um as people become more disparate and isolated we can take that also into questions that might come up about this whole working from home going into the office and where companies are going with that in the future um I would say take every single opportunity in your early career to work physically with people um, because the amount of learning and development and networking you get from being face to face rather than networking uh, rather than uh, remote is is massive so ask your current future employees about their policies on that on that front as well um, there is increasing isolation um, driven by COVID was a huge impact. Technology is another impact. And some people, you know, have, have a combination of those two and, and, and wealth and poverty divides means we have an increasing, increasing volume of people living very alone, separate lives. So I certainly don't know enough to comment on the actual sector of um, psychiatry and therapy. Um, but I do know that the areas that could well drive a need there are certainly growing. Thank you very much. If I could just ask, um, with talent acquisition having a rolling shift to online based assessments with AI bots, when you're not even talking to a person and it's just recording what you're saying, and there's no face to face until the penultimate or last rounds of applications, how can somebody like myself get the foot in the door and kind of impress i guess <laughs> um it's 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 some of it's quite boring practice things so i mentioned at the end uh my final point there was about storytelling and, and it's just so fundamental here the way that you identify some of the things that you have done if you're still at school or if you've completed the university cycle or if you're in your first two or three years in into work the way that you understand what you have achieved and you're able to communicate it in a way that says i have delivered an impact through the way i have approached this it could be exactly the same problem communicated by someone else saying oh i did this thing so the way that you communicate it is is critical and even the um the sort of more ai based chatbot uh in, in a sort of verbal or written interviewing area they they can pick up on this um and and so it, practice is a massive part of it a massive part of being able to tell a story and the telling the story helps you also suck out from your own achievement experience actually that was quite a good thing even if i haven't really realized it up until now so i'm sorry if it sounds like a a vague answer um the more experience you get the more practice you get but talent shines through and all of these new systems and new approaches are they're partly designed to save time and money but they're mostly designed to help organizations find the best talent so you need to find the way of demonstrating your talents and and then you will have the strongest possible way whatever the interview selection approach they're taking is 
Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Um, if I could just ask maybe one more question on sort of failure and career progression. Um, when things go wrong, is starting with a fresh slate in a different career path at the end of the world, in your opinion? Um, well, I went from the army to uh, adventure education to um, digital technologies around taxi hailing to marketing and now very much in the field of, sort of young talent careers so I couldn't rightly say not you can't change careers of course you can um, they don't all have to be failure led um, some of them could be very conscious I think that what you have the huge opportunity in front of you in, in general at your age is that the employment sector now is far more open, comfortable and familiar with changes from one sector to another. I shouldn't say the employment sector, the employment market from one sector to another, far more comfortable with big changes because they're looking for talent and potential and talent potential that started in engineering and now wants to move into finance or start in science and now wants to move into retail. That's actually now attractive to organisations because they bring in different thinking and different sets of experiences and different skill sets. So it's hugely advantageous now for people who do want to go down a route to think, if I go down this route, I'm not stuck in it. It doesn't have to be a rut. So yes, failure can definitely teach you a lot and teach you to and make you change. But also you should be comfortable with the fact that change is a lot more normal now than it was before. And if you start down a route, you don't think, oh, if I go down this route, I'm going to have to do it for 30 years. You're just not. Pick up two good, two good years of really strong skills development experience, tell the story of it, and other sectors will want you too. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I think I'll hand it over to Caroline. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was an absolutely fascinating um, insight into the challenges and the opportunities that young career starters are going to face. I've certainly learned a lot, so I really appreciate that. And Jack, you're absolutely brilliant. Well done. You've shown great skills on this call tonight already. So <laughs> one, one for your portfolio. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, there will be another Beyond Radley talk next term. So please keep an eye on your email and we'll let you know um, what's, what's up next. But thanks for coming and have a lovely evening. Mm -hmm.